Hi guys, this is Critical Care Nurse Skills Review. My name is Jihan and my aim here is to help my fellow nurse practitioner review the necessary skills needed in critical care. The first skill that we are going to review is how to do a critical care nursing assessment. So what is assessment? Assessment is a key component of nursing practice, a systematic collection of all data and information relevant to the care of patients, their problem and their needs, and this is the first part of the nursing process as we know it and thus forms the basis of the care plan. In ICU or critical care areas, the best method to use in assessing the patient is systemic assessment. Now, the content of this video is to summarize the key points in doing a comprehensive assessment in the ICU or in the critical care nursing practice. All right. A systematic and holistic assessment of intensive care patient is considered necessary skills. Each intensive care nurses must have the ability to assess the patient using a comprehensive critical care assessment. These are the key points in conducting comprehensive nursing assessment in the ICU or in a critical care setting. First, quick review of the situation. Here, you will only assess the patient's ABCD using observation technique. So A is for airway, and the next is the breathing. Observe how your patient breathes. Third is the circulation. Observe the circulation of the patient by checking the body temperature, the blood pressure, the heart rate, output of the patient, and the disability or any signs of deterioration or need for immediate intervention. How to do this? By checking the patient's level of consciousness. See how unwell is your patient. Uh, what are the contraptions or what are the life supports that the patient is on? Okay, so that is the first step, is the quick review of the situation. So in, in doing quick review of the situation, this will only take a few minutes, maybe two to three or five minutes. So you will do this as briefly or as quickly as possible. Then after that, move on to the physical examination. Here, you will apply the systemic assessment. Start by doing assessment of your patient's central nervous system. In here, you will assess a patient glasgocoma scale, cranial nerve function, pupil reaction, the muscle response of the patient, and the standard assessment that we are doing in other areas of hospital in central nervous system. So I will not discuss this one by one, but what will I discuss here is the key point that a critical care nurse or ICU nurse must put in mind and must aware of. These are the general consideration and key points in assessing the patient's central nervous system in the ICU. If the patient's primary pathology is a head injury, cranial surgery, or a cerebral event, then your assessment should be adjusted accordingly. Glasgocoma scale in a head injured patient is most useful than when sedation has been stopped. Full cranial and peripheral nerve examination should be performed daily as indicated. Another key point is over sedation. Over sedation is undesirable for a number of reasons and performing daily sedation breaks reduces the length of the ICU stay. That is why a sedation score such as Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale or RAS has been used to monitor and titrate sedation appropriately. So, and also, delirium occurs in 15% to 80% of critical care patients. This contributes to increased mortality and uh, causes cognitive decline in the long term. Delirium should be regularly sought and quantified using the CAM ICU score and management steps such as treatment with haloperidol applied if appropriate. In terms of pain control in the, the ICU, Despite the availability of adequate methods of analgesia and appropriate monitoring, pain control can be poor in the ICU. Pain scores should be recorded and analgesia reviewed daily, particularly for those patients like post-operative patient, patient with traumatic injuries, they really need the analgesia review daily. Ensure that simple analgesia such as paracetamol should be boarded routinely. Although non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are usually avoided in the critical ill patient. Now, how about patients with intracranial pathology? Intracranial pressure monitoring or ICP should be considered for those requiring sedation and at risk of a high ICP. 
hospital protocol such as traumatic brain injury or TBI where targeting cerebral perfusion pressure should be followed when the ICP is greater than 20 to 25 mm per mercury or when there is a clinical or radiological evidence of a raised ICP. Usually CPP greater than 60 mm per mercury. For a patient like this, we applied standard neuroprotection as seen in uh, TBI protocol. This includes head up 30 degrees with the endotracheal tube taped rather than tied. This is to minimize obstruction to the central venous drainage. Then ventilation to partial carbon dioxide of 35 to 45 millimeter per mercury and the maintenance of a partial oxygen at 100 to 120 millimeter per mercury. Glucose should be also within the normal range and steps should be taken to avoid hyperthermia. Now, a disorder in sodium metabolism are common in brain injury. Serum sodium should be maintained at the upper normal range. You also need to ensure that adequate sedation, analgesia, and muscle relaxant are ordered or prescribed to your patient. Also, seizures need prompt treatment and penitoin is the preventive anti-epileptic of choice. The administration of mannitol and hypertonic saline is still controversial, but they are often reserved for use in patients with high ICP or suggestive physical signs, for example, a blown fixed dilated pupil. Hyperventilation is a short-term measure to reduce critical high ICP before the surgical intervention, but should be considered a rescue therapy only. In many centers around the world, ICP monitoring is not available. So patients with severe head injury are sedated and managed without ICP monitoring for 48 to 72 hours. After this time, daily sedation breaks allow assessment of their underlying conditions. Okay, that composed the key points that we need to remember in assessing central nervous system of our patient in the ICU, in addition to this standard CNS assessment that we're doing in the ICU. Now we move on to the another system, the respiratory system. Okay, what are the key points in doing respiratory assessment in ICU patient? A past medical history of respiratory disease, including lung function tests and current respiratory issues should be noted. Examine the patient's airway and respiratory system. If an endotracheal tube is in place, note that the length of the teeth is as documented at insertion and check its position if correct on the most recent chest x-ray. Often, it is only possible to auscultate the chest anteriorly and in the axilla because most of the critical ill patient is unresponsive and on supine position Sometimes we don't have time to turn them to side to auscultate the back. The ventilator settings should be inspected and the measured tidal volume, minute volume, peak, and plateau pressures should be noted. Note whether the patient appears comfortable on the ventilator settings, in particular whether they are fighting the ventilator or display an increased work of breathing. Fighting is the term we use in the ICU, meaning the patient is coordinating poorly with the ventilator. And then next point, assess the patient's saturation and where available, arterial blood gases should be inspected and trends noted. Regular arterial gas measurement of the partial oxygen and partial carbon dioxide, assessment of the partial oxygen and fraction of inspired oxygen ratio and pH are useful in guiding your ventilatory strategy. If the clinical appearance, oxygenation, or blood gases are not satisfactory, then you must address this and notify the respiratory therapist or the physician to alter the ventilator mode uh, settings or le level your, your sedation to improve the situation. Usually, a target that gas exchange are ordered. This should be specific to each patient. Example, a patient with severe COPD may have target of saturation 88% or above. In acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS occurs in up to 14% of ventilated patients and carries a mortality of 40 to 60%. It arises as a complication in both pulmonary and non-pulmonary conditions 
and is diagnosed according to specific criteria. Here are the some points to remember if your, your patient in ARDS. Low tidal volume ventilation of 6 ml per kg and a conservative fluid management strategy should be used in patients with ARDS. Also, aim plateau pressure below 30 cm per water applied, this allowing hypercapnia if necessary. High PEEP has been shown to be beneficial for patients with confirmed ARDS and in a severe left ventricular failure. The doctor and the respiratory therapist use this ventilatory management for those kind of patients. Ensure that if your patient is ARDS, early paralysis with neuromuscular blocking agent may improve outcome in patients with ARDS with the partial oxygen saturation and fraction of inspired oxygen ratio less than 150 millimeter per mercury. If your patient is on weaning, the ICU clinician should implement a strategy for gradual weaning of ventilations from mandatory positive pressure ventilation to a progressive reduction in pressure support. Okay, tracheostomy is often used in the ICU to aid weaning uh, from ventilation and most are now placed using a percutaneous dilatation technique. Usually, we are doing this at bedside. The strength of the patient's cough, their secretion load, and swallow function should be assessed. In patients with tracheostomy, the ability of the patient to tolerate deflation of the cough and use of the speaking valve are important indicators of winning progression. Where available, extubation to non-invasive ventilatory may reduce the risk of reintubation in patients with COPD. Okay, we're done reviewing the key points in assessing the patient. Uh, respiratory system. Next system we will discuss is cardiovascular system.